How are we ready, guys? I was just going to say, if you get your phones out, because we're going to do Mentimeter. So, how do you uh, manage your stress and build resilience? Well, I think, you know, the best thing is to understand your first instant sign of stress. So, it's really important. I think there's some people coming. Come and sit down in the front, guys. I was saying, we're going to use a Mentimeter, so get your phones out. Yeah, so it's really important to understand like what type of stressor you are. Are you an emotional stressor, a mental stressor, or a physical stressor? Because when you know that, you, then you can start to engage some stress modification protocols before you go to burnout. So what we're going to do is I'll get you to hit that QR code, and I'm going to ask you to look at the chart and see what jumps out at you. What, is, what do you identify as being your type of stress? See, a lot of people say, oh, you know, stress doesn't really bother me, right? They hold it in and then they get sick. And we call those somaticizers. Where on the other end of the spectrum, there are people who like really like bleat out and, and cry and, and are quite emotional. So uh, on this chart, you good to go? Yep. Have you guys all got it yet? So over here we've got people who are like a physical stresses. These are all the different types of reactions and there's the mental stresses and then we've got the more emotional stresses. So type in which one do you see happening to you? A lot of people go, oh my God, I didn't know that that was a stress response. Okay, bad mood, tiredness, overthinking, can't sleep, always tired, feel unmotivated, emotional. Yeah, so once you know that what your style is and you can see those behaviours, you're like, okay, I've got to do something. And you start, stop blaming everyone else in your family or, your, or at work. Hypervigilant, clenched jaw, blameful, depressed, rapid heartbeat, crying, withdraw socially, increased procrastination. I did that one. Yeah. So lots of overthinking. So we've got a lot of mental stresses in this group. Because you're probably because you're cognitive athletes or going into that uh, type of job. Okay, so. What's really important is when you start to see this, what gives you your biggest bang for your buck is learning how to sleep. Now we know that humans, whether you're living in the hill tribes of Papua New Guinea or whether you live in Germany or you know, Kudamundra, humans generally need about 7.5 hours sleep. There are a few exceptional humans that, I think there's about four in 10,000 that only need four hours sleep. They've got a deck two gene. And actually there's an over-representation of these people in jobs like, you know, um, military colonels, generals, um, people who are in um, startups, um, CEOs, maybe here, but most generally humans need 7.5 hours sleep. So I did some research with McKinsey, put um, these trackers on people, and then we gave them some uh, cognitive tests and IQ tests and what we found was those that had 45 minutes sleep debt were 10% more stupid the next day. Okay, so when you think about if you're a management consultant in a very competitive landscape, being 10% more stupid is quite significant, right? So you actually can't get away with sleep deprivation when you're in this kind of highly competitive environment. We also found though if you got 30 minutes of deep slow wave sleep um, that neutralised that stupidity. So it does make you smarter. And what's interesting, once you've been sleep deprived, it's gone, you can never get it back, but you can preload sleep. When you know you're going into a busy time, you can bank it up. So go to bed a little bit earlier. But once it's gone, it's gone. So sleep debt. So I imagine all of you have had, you know, at least one night's sleep. Did you get really stressed the next day? Did you worry about, oh no, I haven't had enough sleep and you looked for evidence of it? Okay, so this is something really important. You've got to decouple sleep deprivation from sleep anxiety, because otherwise you're giving yourself a double whammy. And in fact, the anxiety about 
not sleeping is almost as detrimental, I think, in fact, more detrimental than the actual sleep deprivation. So when they do research and they ask, what is most predictive of your performance the next day? It's an interesting answer. Do you think it's A, how well you slept, B, how well you think you slept, or C, how early you woke up? What is most predictive of how well you will perform the next day after one night of sleep deprivation? A, anyone, A? B? Yep, it's B, yeah. So remember this, if you don't have a good night for one night and you've got an important day, don't stress about it because then you're like double whamming it. Just go, I'm smart, I'm young, and actually I'm gonna be fine, okay? Remember this because so many people get anxious about it. But there is a point where sleep deprivation does turn. Does anyone know how long it takes before you start to like see that impact? Have a guess. Oh, no, <laughs> that's, yeah, three days. So uh, three days of 60%. What we find is a, is a decline in your cognitive performance and your risk taking and emotional decision making. So risk taking is an interest, uh, interesting thing. What do you think? Do you think we get more sillier, like we do stupid stuff when we're tired, risky stuff, or do you think we get risk averse? A, sillier, riskier, or do we get risk averse? What do you think? We actually, yeah, more risk taking behaviour, but there is a gender difference. Not my opinion, it's data. Who do you think gets riskier and sillier when they're tired? Men or women? Men do. <laughs> okay, that's, that's data, it's not my opinion. So just remember that they do silly stuff when they're tired. <laughs> okay, so does anyone know what happens in your brain when you're sleep deprived? New research, this is super fascinating. So I want you to remember this slide. Next time you feel like kicking the dog, leaving your job, breaking up your, from your partner, leave, you know, getting divorced, needing to you know, have a big life change, move apartments, just have a think about this slide. We know that sleep deprivation makes you anxious and it makes you crazy. And in fact, that's why they use it as a torture because it does do terrible things to you. So I'm gonna explain the mechanism. Whenever you think, memorise, um, talk, you know, cogitate, any type of mental activity uses brain energy. And I don't know if you can remember from year eight biology, but there's something called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which goes little uh, reaction in your brain and off comes phosphate energy and then something's left behind. This stuff is called adenosine. It's the metabolic byproduct of thinking. And over through the day, it builds up, builds up, builds up. And it's mother nature's dimmer switch. When this builds up to a certain point, um, your brain's saying, okay, go and have a good lie down. And you feel slow and you feel dumb, okay? But adenosine gives you an impending sense of doom. It makes you feel terrible. And so humans love to post-rationalize and they'll go, oh, I feel terrible. It must be my job, my partner, my whatever. But actually, this stuff makes you feel horrible. And we know this because adenosine is also used as a heart medication for tachycardia. And when doctors have to administer it to the patient, they have to hold their hand and they say, don't worry, you're not gonna die because they actually feel like dying. So remember this next time when you feel terrible, just think, have I, had a, have I like maybe got adenosine in my brain? Uh, caffeine does block it, but after three days it doesn't work. So in fact, people who drink coffee and they're sleep deprived for three days actually do more stupid stuff. They don't know how sleep deprived they are. So guess how you get rid of adenosine? <laughs> yes. But one special part of your sleep architecture is the only way to get rid of this, and it's deep, slow wave sleep. So this is someone in an MRI, you can see the cerebral spinal fluids going and just flushing away all of that adenosine. But the problem is, sometimes we sleep and we don't actually get into deep sleep. And then we feel anxious. So I always say, if you, know, you don't feel good, go away, sleep, good three days, and then come back and tell me you know, how you really feel. And remember this, okay? You may not be getting into deep sleep. So I'll just quickly go through sleep cycles. So we've got 
90 minute sleep cycles and hopefully you get like four or five, hopefully six of these a night. And so down here is a deep slow wave sleep. This is really important because it's where all your physical replenishment, it's where your adrenal repair happens, it's where all of your growth hormone happens. Very important for, you know, re physical replenishment. Then we've got REM sleep. Does anyone know what REM sleep does? What do you do in REM sleep? When your eyes go rapid eye movement? This is where we dream, but it's also where we make sense of our emotional part of our world. But what's also really important, it's where we forget. There's a heap of crap that happens in our life that we don't want to remember. And in fact, if you don't hit REM sleep, you get quite anxious because this is the defrag. This is the filing, the bin, the keep, delete part of your sleep. And this is why alcohol makes you feel like you've got anxiety because alcohol cuts off the REM sleep. So we know that men who sleep less than five hours a night have lower testosterone, smaller testicles, and girls have a lot more menstrual problems. So there's some two very good reasons for you to get um, good sleep. So if you want to get to sleep, you have to land a plane. You can't just get into bed and go, you know, go to sleep. You have to do it really slowly because there's a whole lot of biochemical reactions that have to take place. So question, what's more important, sleep duration or sleep consistency? Who thinks A? Who thinks B? Yes. I didn't know this until I did the research. Yes, you ne your body needs to know what's happening because inside every single cell in your body is a little tiny clock, your circadian clock, and it wants to know what, what time it is. And so if you can't get much sleep, you've got to get regular sleep. So try to go to sleep within the same 15 minute window. Don't go to bed eight one night, one one night, 10 one night. Just go to bed 11.30 every single night, okay? And your body will love you for it because it knows what to do. Okay, does anyone get into bed utterly exhausted and then all of a sudden you think about your day tomorrow and then you're like super awake? You're like, what happened? It's super frustrating. Does anyone do this? Yeah, I do it all the time still and I know what happens. The reason this happens is, okay, so this is a brain. Up the top here, someone put someone in a scanner and they showed them a picture of a white bear. You can see the occipital lobe, the, the visual cortex lights up. That, then they said in that second picture, imagine a white bear. As you can see, the same part of the brain lights up. So what happens when you're lying in bed and you're thinking stressful thoughts about tomorrow, your body thinks, hmm, better be safe than sorry. I might have to fight something. So it, what it'll do, it'll produce fight or flight hormones just in case something bad's gonna happen. And so you'll secrete adrenaline and cortisol. We know that once you've secreted cortisol, it takes 30 minutes for that to dissipate out of your system. So if you're lying there at midnight, oh, can't go to sleep, cortisol. Half an hour later, I'm still awake, more cortisol. Okay, so <coughs> what you've got to do, you've got to be super disciplined about what you let run around in your head at night. So you have a safe basket of thoughts that you're only allowed to think when you're horizontal in bed. It can't be work-related, stress-related, finance, whatever that is, uni-related, exams. You're not allowed to think about that. But what does your brain do if it says, if you say, don't do something? It does it. It does it. That's why you've got to have an alternative thought ready to go and write out five things. It's got to be, we call it ASTAD, alternate, technical, slightly distracting um, thought. And so it's got to be like repetitive, like, you know, knitting in your mind's eye, making your favourite meal, jogging your jogging route, doing your asanas, but it's got to be slightly boring, but also not emotionally evoking. My favourite when I get, when I'm super awake and activated is I think, what if I uh, won $500 million, who would I secretly help? And I just think about that. It's kind of a nice thing to think. And that, that works every time. Okay, some sleep hacks. Which light should you have on the, in your lead up to bed? Not those ones. The reason being is that if you have bright overhead lights hitting the bottom of your retinal cells, which are just basically brain cells hanging out of your skull, it activates your fight or flight system. So remember, our brain still thinks we're in, on the savannas of East Africa. And there were only two reasons why humans were up late at night out of the cave with the moon in their eyes shining down. What were those two reasons? 
hunt or be hunted. So if your brain detects light from above hitting your retinas, it will think something's happening and then the next day you're more aggressive because you might have to fight something and you're more hungry. Okay, so try to have no overhead lights in the lead up to bed. And in fact, in my bedroom, I bought like a 30 buck, um, like a bendy light off eBay with the red globe. And this is really good. It sort of like calms down the system. Doom scrolling before bed, terrible. Not only are you getting light into your eye, anything more than 80 lux sets off your brain. But the fact that you're looking at the material, like you're seeing your friends on an amazing holiday, you're seeing your ex-boyfriend, you're seeing this, you're seeing that, and that actually produces chemicals that will keep you awake, okay? If you ever have to look at your phone at night, hold it on the side so you don't get um, light straight into your eyeballs. Your room should be cold, less than 21 degrees Celsius, and it should be dark. So that means if you can hold your hand out in front of you and you can see your hand, it's not dark enough. Otherwise, you're setting off your circadian rhythm. If you can't get to sleep, name to tame. Just dump um, everything in your brain out of your brain. Okay, so pre-sleep eating is very important. So you might be eating stuff that'll stop you from getting into deep, slow wave sleep or REM. Don't, if you can't sleep at night, don't have caffeine after 12. It's got a six hour half-life. If you're okay, maybe three o'clock, okay? If you eat protein at night, like a big chunk of meat, your body will prioritise digesting that over deep sleep. So if you do eat meat, eat at lunchtime, vegetarian at night, and oh my God, your sleep is dramatically better. If you eat in the three hours before bed, you have worse sleep. And in fact, people who eat sugar before bed sleep on average 26 minutes less than people who don't eat sugar. Yeah, it's really quite significant. MSG, you know, you know what flavoring, it makes everything taste delicious, too good to be true. Monosodium glutamate, flavor enhancers, it's a neurotransmitter glutamate. It, so I don't know if you've ever had this thing, you've eaten some takeaway, then you get like exhausted, then you get into bed and you have crazy dreams and then you wake up really tired, that's MSG. If you ever have MSG, the best antidote is vitamin C, okay? This stuff ruins your sleep. You get no slow wave sleep and lots of REM sleep. Alcohol is really bad for your sleep. If you do um, drink before bed, try to have drinks that have got less sugar. Um, try to walk before bed. And if you can't walk, um, squat while you're doing, brushing your teeth, engaging your big muscle groups, and that will burn off some of the ethanol and sugar out of the alcohol. What you should eat, foods ripped in, rich in tryptophan. This is the, the precursor to melatonin, which is the um, sleep hormone. So nuts, um, cottage cheese, cherry juice is the best. It's got the most amount of tryptophan in it, but it's a bit sweet. Try to eat vegetarian at night. Um, try to only eat when the sun's up and try to avoid having too much melatonin tablet. Anyone take melatonin tablets? If you give your body free melatonin, your own body will stop producing it. Okay, oh, what did happen then? We've gone to the wrong slide. We just need to go to, yeah, that's it. Okay, so what we're gonna do quickly, play Sleep Killer Bingo. I want you to look at this chart, and I, this is one bingo you don't wanna win. And I want you to identify all the things that you do which are impacting your sleep and get out your um, app. And I want you to pick one thing that you're going to promise to change, just one thing. So um, have you got the, that's it, yeah. Okay, is anyone doing like more than five of those things? Yes. <laughs> yeah, are you doing like 25? <laughs> Do you sleep badly? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I made this list because I, I do a lot, most of them. <laughs> Okay, let's go and see. 
What are you guys going to promise? Just one thing. Okay, heavy meat. Have it for lunch. Yeah, your body just doesn't like sleeping with a big chunk of meat in it. Arguing before bed. Is that with yourself or with your partner? <laughs> doom scrolling. Okay, who said doom scrolling? Scrolling before bed. Anyone? You've got to, what, what are you going to do? How are you, not only are you going to say you're going to stop it, you have to come up with like a really good plan to make sure you don't do it. So if you're a, if you're a bedtime scroller, charge your phone in another room because you know what? It's a dopamine addiction and you actually can't stop yourself if it's in hands reach. So you need to put it in another room. And then people say, oh, but I need it for my alarm. Get yourself like an old school alarm clock or turn up the volume really high and put it somewhere else. Watching TV in bed, that's a no-no. That's a really bad no-no. Um, you should always separate your, your um, parts of your life. Room too hot, so you can put um, a wet washer on the bottom of your feet um, and then put a fan on it, it's a good one. All right, well done guys. Well, I hope you actually do your um, sleep killer bingo promise. Did you have a question? Oh. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you.